Okay, this is going to be our replacement for in poison for a Sunday morning. So folks from First Baptist Church of Lowell and Bible Baptist Church of Rensselaer are welcomed, uh, obviously, and you don't have to do it Sunday morning. Uh, and anybody else that wants to pay attention to it, fine and dandy. It's going to be longer than the usual 15 or 20 minutes because I... Uh, know that the folks of both churches have a longer attention span. So uh, this happens to be, uh, if uh, if it is April 19th that you're actually watching it, is the official first Sunday that I began to pastor uh, First Baptist Church of Lowell 23 years ago. Okay, so been at Rensselaer 32 and a half. And at Lowell, to Vente, a tree yells a go. And uh, I got in front of me the reference Bible, obviously, where I could make the print larger and all that stuff. I also have what's called a Bible analyzer. Okay, where this is a new development in the last couple of weeks, where a brother named Tim Morton has taken the reference Bible I sent him uh, the files, and then he put it in a program called Bible Analyzer. And uh, for a, let's see, how does this work on, uh, for a seed faith vow of, let's see, $99.99, then we'll send it to you absolutely free. Actually, you can just get it online, download it for $9.95, something like that. I'm not sure. Okay, I think it's nine ninety five, but it might be a useful source, uh, and I might I got it in front of me, but I also got my copy of the reference Bible in front of me, so I can go back and forth with a click of the button. This is actually how I learned the Bible. I went through five years of a Christian college, got into work, and had to admit to myself, "Hey, you don't know much Bible," and so. Then I started purchasing cassette tapes. I had bought so many cassette tapes, I got tapeworms. And so uh, that's how I learned the Bible, verse by verse, uh, with me, myself, and I asking the Spirit of God to guide and direct. Okay, I'm going to look at Matthew 13 this morning or this afternoon or whenever you're watching it, anytime. It's going to go longer than usual. Uh, than the usual 15 or 20 minutes uh, as we go through the Bible verse by verse, specifically Matthew 13. Okay, we got to do a little background on Matthew. Uh, obviously, the first book of the New Testament, but uh, it does. The New Testament wasn't instituted until the death of Christ. So this, uh, the record is Judaism. The record of this account is operating under. Religious Judaism. The Lord Jesus Christ was introduced to be the king of the Jews. He gave his constitution in chapter 5, 6, and 7 for the millennial kingdom. He demonstrated many miracles, okay, many, many miracles, evidence of signs and wonders because he was going to the Jews. And then in chapter 10, he just came right out and told the apostles. He said, uh, we're going to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But unfortunately, the lost sheep of the house of Israel in chapter 12, after seeing all that evidence, committed the unpartable sin. As a people, I don't fully understand how it's done as far as the people, where specifically in the context it's just the Pharisees. But somehow that blinded the nation of Israel. <clears throat> and so in chapter 13, Jesus goes right into uh seven mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. He starts speaking in parables. He, he <clears throat> hides truth in plain sight, just like the devil hides truth in plain sight. Uh, and God hides truth in plain sight. They do it for different reasons. The devil is doing it because he's marked his territory. And God is doing it because he wants to see if we are sincere or not. So Matthew 13 are seven mysteries for the kingdom of heaven. Uh, Paul and John give seven mysteries for the kingdom of God. 
Okay, but we're going to, I'm going to look at uh, two of the seven mysteries in Matthew chapter 13 and then look at them from the perspective of what we are experiencing in our country. Isn't it amazing how the media, the news media, can scare people? Amazing. Okay, and in this storyline, when we read about the Lord Jesus, he personally is going to explain or give the interpretation of two of the seven. Okay, the other five, you and I will need to get it direct from the Spirit of God. Okay, the seven parables and or mysteries. Okay, where in verse 12, for whosoever hath to him shall be given and he shall have more abundance I'm sorry, verse 11. And he answered and said unto them, because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. Okay, so that's after the disciples ask him, why are you speaking in parables? Okay, then he answers it. Okay, the first one is the parable of the sower and the seed. And then there's one called the tares and the wheat. Okay, then there's one with a mustard seed. uh, One with a leavened meal or leavened bread and then there's a hidden treasure <clears throat> and then the sixth one is a pearl of great price and then the last one somebody's fishing not with a pole but with a throw net okay i'm going to look at today uh during this time i'm going to look at the tares and the wheat and then the leavened bread those are the two i'm going to look at The tares and the weed are no-brainers because Jesus himself interprets it for us. Uh, The leavened bread, uh, then we're going to have to allow the scriptures to interpret themselves in order to get the meaning for that. In verse 24, okay, if you run down through uh, the chapter, okay, if you got a Bible in front of you, eating some popcorn or munching on something, got your feet up on a coffee table or whatever, lounging in the living room, you know, throwing spit wads at each other. Okay, you'll see in verse, let's see, number three is the parable of the sower and the seed, and that's four different uh, responses that a person has to hearing the word of God. Okay, and then Jesus explains that and starts in verse 18. Verse 24, you got a paragraph mark, and there's the second one. <clears throat> verse 31 is the third one. Verse 33 is the fourth one. It's only a one sentence or a one liner. And then in verse 44 is uh, the fifth one. It's only one verse. Uh, the pearl of great price, number six, is 46 and 40, or 45 and 46, two verses. And then uh, verse 47 is, uh, runs one, two, three, four, four verses for that one. So, and the Lord himself only explained uh, two of them. Verse 24, that's the one I want to look at here this morning or whatever time it is. Uh, It says, another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man. Okay, it's like something. Remember that the two words, like and as, are two of the most important words to understand the Bible. Okay, the kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. And while men slept... His enemies came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. And when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst not thou sow good seed in thy field? From whence then hath it tares? And he said unto them, An enemy hath done this. The servant said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? Okay, get the hope or yank the tares out. And he said, uh, Nay, lest while ye gather up the tares, ye root up also the wheat with them. Okay, and of course, any farm kid knows uh, the illustration. Anybody that has a garden knows that if you let the weed get too big, right next to the plant, when you decide to yank the weed out, 
it's going to pull the plant with it. Okay, so then the Lord says, let both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, gather ye together first the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. Okay, so there's that parable. Now, a person can run through that and think that you're getting your interpretation or throw in your opinion or my interpretation of that passage is you i mean anybody can do anything they want this one the lord jesus actually does the interpreting for us okay so in uh, verse 36 <clears throat> then jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house of a uh, house and went into the house and his disciples came unto him, saying, Declare unto us the parable of the tares of the field. Okay, Lord, please explain that. He answered and said unto them, He that soweth the good seed is the Son of Man. Okay, so we know seed from the previous, from the previous um, parable is referenced to the word of God. Okay, but here he's referring it to something a little bit different. The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom. Okay, doctrinally, the Jewish people. Okay, and the tares are the children of the wicked one. Okay, so literal, oh boy, yeah, literal children of the wicked one, the enemy, Satan, Leviathan, Lucifer. So you have the children of the kingdom, real Jews, and you have fake Jews. Okay, so that's what the Lord is saying here. And they're both go going together. In, in the land of Israel right now, you have natural born Jews who are sincerely following Judaism. Okay, that's probably the minority. You have natural born Jews who are secular atheists. The vast majority of them are. And then you have a mystical Jews, which often are fake Jews, Revelation 2.9, which are keeping the Kabbalah and are the powers that be of whatever conspiracy you want to put in there. Deep state, okay, Illuminati, no matter what. what you could just throw in anything you want in there. So they're, they're up, they're going together. When you go into Israel, that's what a person's going to find. Verse 39, the enemy that sowed them is the devil. Okay, the harvest is the end of the world. Okay, the end of the world, is this the absolute complete end at the end of the millennium? Okay, um, and the reapers are the angels. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall be in the end of this world. Now, this way says this world. And the Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and them which do iniquity. So it looks like the millennial kingdom. And shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. Okay, so either way on that, if you want to put that at the end of the tribulation or at the end of the millennium, uh, if, you know, a person can fuss about it and think your whole spiritual and all that stuff. Go ahead. Okay, but... The tares and wheat. Now, anybody raising a farm or anybody plants a garden, <clears throat> like in uh, soybeans, there's a counterfeit soybean. It's a, you know, it would be considered a tear. Uh, it looks like a soy, soybean to many people, but not to farmers, not to farm kids. It's a counterfeit. Okay, and it, it just goes, it just happens. <clears throat> So here in this, the doctrinal uh, <clears throat> footing of this is uh, the Jewish kingdom, and there are real Jews and fake Jews. Okay, now the general principle here is that the tares and the wheat are together. Now we can take that <clears throat> and apply that also in knowledge or information, 
where we live in a day and age of great information, <clears throat> great knowledge is available to us, Thank, thanks to Al Gore, you know, and the internet. He mis- made a mistake there. But we also, at the same time, have misinformation or disinformation, okay, uh, in this age. I mean, in Matthew 24, when the apostles asked Jesus about the signs of the end, that he said, take heed that no man deceive you. So we live in a day and age of the ease of deception. Okay, so we have a lot of information, a lot of knowledge, but we also have a lot of misinformation. A fellow one time said that if you don't watch the news, you're uninformed. But if you watch the news, you're misinformed. And personally, I'd rather be uninformed than misinformed. And so they're all put together. So the question may come up is, why in the world does God allow good and evil to be intermingled where it's difficult to tell them apart? Well, there's a reason. Okay, and so I want to jump down to the fourth parable. And on this one, this will bring this idea of tares and wheat within the church setting. Okay, in verse 33. It says, another parable spake he unto them, the kingdom of heaven. I I do find it interesting. That phrase, kingdom of heaven, is found 33 times in the Bible. The old Masons like that number, don't they? Okay, the kingdom of heaven is like unto leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal till the whole was leavened. Okay, a... Cross-reference of this for us in the New Testament is Galatians 5, where a little leaven leavens the whole lump. Okay, so as uh, the Bible is a self-interpreting book, and, and the Spirit of God is the teacher and guide of this book. Okay, where the kingdom of heaven, okay, that is described... Uh, by the Lord Jesus in Matthew eleven twelve, where it operates by violence. Okay, so that is the physical aspect of the kingdom of heaven. It has a physical aspect where the kingdom of God has a spiritual aspect first. Okay, the kingdom of God is likened unto leaven. Okay, with that one, I got several cross-references. Probably the best one in the mix of those right now would be the Matthew uh, 16, verse 6 through 12, where the Lord Jesus likens leaven to false doctrine. Matthew 16, verse 6. Jesus said unto them, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Okay, so they reason among themselves, saying, It is because we've taken no bread. So evidently they thought the Pharisees and Sadducees were a bunch of bakers in town. Okay, the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. What is that? Well, in verse 16, he throws a question at them. Verse, uh, nine, or verse 8, he throws a question. Verse 9, he throws another question. Verse 10, he throws another question. And then verse 11, he throws another question. You see, the Lord is trying to get us to think. And then it says, then after the one, two, three, four, four questions... Then understood they how that he bade them not beware of the leaven of bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Okay, so there, there it is. Right in front of us, or uh, cross-reference shows that if we go back to this parable, the kingdom of heaven is like unto leaven. So doctrine of the Pharisees, or False doctrine, which a woman took. 
Okay, a woman in the Old Testament might say strange woman in Proverbs. Okay, where the bride of Christ, the born-again believers, are referred to as a chaste virgin. Well, this is a woman. Okay, a strange woman. I'll run across reference to Revelation 12, 17, 5. Okay, this woman would be a representative of a false church. So the kingdom of heaven is like unto leaven, false doctrine which a false church took and hid in three measures of meal. Okay, this is called a meat offering till the whole was leavened. This meat offering, I run it back to Leviticus 2. And Leviticus 2 reveals its fine flour. And so this is a uh, meat offering is likened to bread back there in Leviticus chapter 2. It's uh, the first burnt offering is a picture of salvation. And the second offering, meat offering, is a picture of uh, the scriptures. So what do we need in this meat offering? It says fine flour, so that's pure bread. Pour oil upon it, so we need the Holy Ghost, and put frankincense thereon. Incense pictures prayer, if you run that to Psalm 141, 2. Okay, and then in this oblation, they had to uh, part it in pieces, so you got to rightly divide the word of truth. Okay, and then this would be unleavened cakes in verse 4. Unleavened cakes. So what would be the interpretation by the Spirit of God of this parable? The kingdom of heaven is like unto false doctrine, which a false church took this false doctrine and put it in a Bible till the whole was leavened, till the whole Bible was raunchy. Okay, now that. Uh, began way, way, way back, okay, with a guy named Origen, okay, maybe pronounced it Oregon, I don't know. Uh, that was, that would be the basis for all the new Bibles. And of course, they, the, the Fifth Avenue um, advertisement is, oh, there's no doctrinal changes, there's no doctrinal differences, there's no major doctrine that's affected, no, no, no. Oh, there's not? Oh. So in both of these, what we have now is you have the tares and wheat, and then you got a tainted Bible. And the tainted Bibles have infected the church. That's why the church is leavened. That's why it's allowed to see it. It's a mess. So why would God allow this to happen? Okay, why do we have information and misinformation? Why is there more misinformation than there is information? Okay, you go to the Christian bookstore, and there's going to be more leavened Bibles than there are pure Bibles. If you go to the Christian colleges and seminaries, they're going to be attacking, changing, belittling, berating the pure Bible and pushing and lying about the fake Bibles. Why does God allow these things to happen? Well, this is God's method of seeing who is sincere. It's a, really, it's a master plan, if you think about it. A sincere person will weed through all the misinformation and all the lies and discover that there is, oh, here's, here's the plant in here that's good. Second uh, Corinthians 1.12 says, for, for our rejoicing is this, the testimony of our conscience, that in simplicity and godly sincerity, 
not with fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God, we have had our conversation in the world and more abundantly to you, to you word. Sincerity. A sincere person will take the time, will put forth a diligent effort and to study in order to discover the truth. But sadly, the vast majority, 2 Corinthians 2.17 says, For we are not as many which corrupt the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as of God, in the sight of God speak we in Christ. He says in Ephesians 6, 4, we ought to love the, our Lord God in sincerity. So the reason why God allows information and misinformation is because this is his method of discovering sincere people. To prove the sincerity of your love, you'll find in 2 Corinthians 8, Verse 8. In Philippians, Paul said that ye may approve things that are excellent, that ye, that ye may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. In Titus 2, one of the characteristics uh, Paul told Tim, uh, Titus that he would like young men to have, young men likewise exhort to be sober-minded, and then in verse 7, in, sh in all things showing thyself a pattern of good works, in doctrine showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that he that's of the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of you. Sincerity like a little child, 1 Peter 2, 2, as newborn babies desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. So that's one of the reasons why God allows the tares and the wheat to grow together. That's why God allows the, the churches to be infested with fake Bibles. That's why Israel is infested with fake Jews or apostate Jews. Okay, this is all part of the program of God because he wants to see who will sincerely Seek after him. Now, there's another quality that goes along with this, and of course, this is a master plan of God, is that, okay, when you sincerely are studying, and as you're weeding through truth and error and tares and wheat and weeding through all this stuff, there's going to be times that you're going to get hoodwinked. I'm going to get hoodwinked. Okay, where we may be taking the tares and actually believe that portion or this error, and accepted this portion. But then with time, God in his grace might show us, oh, that was an error. It was, you know, a slight error, but it's an error. And if a person is uh, humble, he's willing to admit it. If a person is proudful, prideful, then he's going to corrupt the word of God. He's going to change it to make you say what he wants. So... If a person, actually, I should say honesty should be the first one. We, honesty will be where we can admit uh, that it was wrong. Humility is when we can accept it to be wrong and then correct it. So I, I suppose my steps should go sincerity first, honesty second, and then humility is third. All three of those are attitudes. Okay, all three of those. Uh, so honesty, it's, I find it, oh, strange and unusual, but the word honest is not well liked in the new Bibles. Okay. Where in Luke chapter eight, verse 15, one of the recipients of the parable of the sower and the seed is the one that receives truthful information. It says that he, but that on good ground are they which an honest and good heart, having heard the word, keep it and bring forth fruit with patience. Okay, honesty, I'm not quite sure where it's topic goes on, on honesty. So the reason why God allows the tares and the wheat, the truth and the air, the good and evil to grow up side by side is that that is his one way of discovering who is sincere. Okay, and then 
And then when we make mistakes on some of the air, then we're going to be honest and say, eh, okay, that wasn't, that wasn't uh, okay. And then humility is when we're willing to admit it. So this is God's program where it says that in Isaiah, let me see, but to this man will I look. Isaiah chapter 66 where it says, For all those things hath mine hand made, and all these things have been, saith the Lord. But to this man will I look, even to him that is poor and a, a contrite spirit, and trembleth at my word. And then in uh, verse 5, Hear the word of the Lord, ye that tremble at his word. Now the ones who demonstrate that, uh, that trembling at God's words uh, is Ezra. You'll find that Ezra chapter 9. Ezra chapter 7 is when he's introduced in the Bible. And then chapter 9 verse 4 is when he demonstrates this because the Lord, the Lord is looking for this, this poor and contrite spirit. The cross reference for that is in Isaiah, let's see, 57, verse 15, where it's uh, another take on it, where he said, For thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell in the high and holy place with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit, to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. So this is why we have so much information, misinformation. And so in our current uh, situation, okay, this virus, okay, uh, and everything, uh, you know, some say, oh, you know, it accidentally happened. Others say, oh, it's a conspiracy, which it is. Uh, it's just a matter of where it's going to go. And it doesn't matter which way it goes. The believer uh, should be doing the most important thing that you can do to help during times of prosperity and or adversity. And what is that? To walk with God. Spend time in his word. Be faithful to him. Okay, and so uh, when people think it's this way, we're, we're patient with that. If they think it's this way and they're scared, okay, we understand that. Um, we just recognize that we need to walk with our God, and then during times of desperation, possibly, possibly, people would uh, be uh, more willing or more open uh, to the truth.